You may have heard of this tragic case of Adriana Smith. Adriana was a 31-year-old pregnant nurse. She walked into the emergency room with a headache and she was sent home. She died the very next day, but her body was kept alive for 20 more weeks. And this is the true story of Adriana and what medicine missed. And I'm going to get to the bottom of this and try to explain why she actually died. So hang with me. So this is Adriana when she was pregnant. As you can see, she appears to be a normal 31-year-old woman who's pregnant. Here's some news reporting on her. You'll find it widely reported. It's a national story. And just as a reminder, this is not medical advice. This is just educational. So Adriana is from Atlanta, Georgia. And this story is from 2025. She's a nurse. She was nine weeks pregnant with her first baby. This was her first baby, and it was an early part of her pregnancy. Normally, when these complications happen, they're often late. So she was only nine weeks in. So what happened? There was a tragic collapse. She reported severe headaches. Her boyfriend or husband took her to the emergency room in Atlanta. She was sent home. Apparently, they did give her some kind of medication, but she did not get imaging. She collapsed the very next day. She was brought back to the hospital and they found blood clots. And then she was understood to have some kind of stroke syndrome. And she was declared brain dead, which means there is irreversible cessation of her brain functioning, even though her body is still working in some domains. So the doctors continued life support for 20 plus weeks. A baby was delivered at 29 weeks. And many people are talking about that part as the controversial part. I'm going to focus more on what actually killed her. What actually caused the brain death, at least that part of her death? We know Georgia law regarding fetal personhood at six weeks did play a legal role in her continuation of her life support. But I think what most people are interested in and what most people are missing at this point to understand is what caused her brain death. How did this happen in the first place? We know she was removed from life support after birth because she was already brain dead. But how does this young woman become brain dead in the first place? Nobody's really figured that out. So I'm going to figure that out for you here today. So I think there is some suspicion of medical malpractice. I'm not saying that's definitive, but what we know so far is that she was sent home and she didn't have any of the standard imaging tests. So why were there no tests? Here's a news report where it said that the people at Northside Hospital released her and they gave her some medication, probably just some pain medication for her headache. I'm not sure exactly what they gave her. But the hospital did not run any scans or tests. And I think that's where people were concerned because that does appear to be lower than the standard of care for a pregnant woman with severe headache. So why was she sent home? Why are no tests? It seems that there should be mandatory imaging. So I think the first reason why she had brain death is because of some possible medical malpractice. But I think what we really want to know is what was happening clinically. How did she get those blood clots in the first place? And I'm going to answer that for you. So in terms of her clinical presentation, this sudden deterioration with blood clots and a severe headache, the most likely explanation is what's called a cerebral, meaning in the brain, venous, meaning in the non-arteries, because the circulatory system in the body has arteries and veins. So this would be in the veins of the brain, a sinus thrombosis. And thrombosis means like a blood clot. And the sinus is just another description of the veins. So basically a blood clot or set of blood clots in the veins in the brain, this CVST. I think that's the most likely explanation. Um, the second most likely explanation is an ischemic stroke. So that would be a blood clot. That's what ischemic means. And stroke means lack of blood supply to the brain, basically. A third possibility is a hemorrhagic stroke where it's not a blood clot problem, but a problem with too much bleeding in the brain. So those are three possibilities. A third one that's lower on the differential diagnosis list would be TTP or HELP syndrome. These are rare syndromes in pregnancy, but they're also possible. So let's focus on the most likely explanation. Why would there be this blood clotting in the brain? So first of all, we know just generally pregnancy is an incredibly risky time for blood clotting, 400 to 900% increased risk of blood clotting. That's huge. So every woman who is pregnant should know that this is a risk. OB-GYNs will sometimes start prescribing aspirin for women who are higher at risk for preeclampsia. But overall, pregnancy has this prothrombotic state. So it's for a number of reasons. One, 
Blood is more coagulable. It's called hypercoagulability. There's more clotting factors that increase in the blood. So the blood is more likely to clot in general. The reason is because when women give birth, these mechanisms are designed to prevent them from bleeding out and dying. But the downside is that there's also a higher risk of clotting. So you can bleed too much or you can clot too much. And there's this fine balance. And the mechanisms that have been designed in pregnancy lean towards increased clotting to prevent the woman from bleeding out. This normally happens in the third trimester. The effect, it will peak in the third trimester and afterwards, but the risk is also elevated from the first trimester onwards. So this is probably a factor in Adriana's death, as it would be for any woman who has a problem with blood clotting. There's also higher estrogen during pregnancy, and estrogen, we're going to hear, is one of the reasons why people have more blood clots. So you give somebody estrogen, they're going to have more blood clots. Estrogen goes up during pregnancy, people have more blood clots. So women are going to also have lower fibrinolysis. Fibrinolysis is a part of the blood that's involved with breaking up clots. Lysis means cutting and fibrin is clot. So there are these molecules that break up clots. They're lower as well. It's not only are there higher clotting factors, higher estrogen, but there's lower numbers of molecules that break down clots. So that's a general thing, but I think there's more specific things, not just for all women, but specific risk factors that may have been at play for Adriana. So number one, maybe she had some fertility treatments. Maybe she was doing IVF. 31 is a little bit young to do IVF, but if you go to an IVF clinic, you're going to meet plenty of women between 30 and 35. And in fact, in most IVF clinics, 40 and above is the vast minority of women in the IVF clinic. She could have been on some hormone supplements before that have persisted, but higher estrogen could have happened from her other fertility treatments. We don't know. Number two, we know African-Americans have a 300% higher risk for lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. And autoimmune diseases increase the risk of blood clotting. So perhaps she had lupus at play in her presentation. There's other conditions like sarcoidosis, which are higher in African-Americans as well. But lupus specifically may have been at play for a pregnant woman. There's something called antiphospholipid syndrome. If she had prior miscarriages and this was her first viable pregnancy, Perhaps she had this other syndrome called antiphospholipid syndrome that can increase the risk of these blood clots and should be worked up. Obesity generally for anyone, males and females, the increased adipose tissue or fat tissue itself is an organ in the body and it secretes all these inflammation molecules that contribute to blood clotting. And also the fat tissue itself increases estrogen in the body. That's why we see a lot of estrogen related cancers that are more common when we gain weight. And in women who are pregnant, if somebody is overweight or struggling with obesity, they're going to have a higher risk of blood clots and these kind of syndromes. So that could have been a factor for her as well. Smoking, we have no reason to suggest or suspect that she was smoking, but smoking also increases blood clots in general. For example, many primary care doctors will know if you meet a young woman on oral contraceptive pills which increase estrogen, she's smoking, you want to think risk of blood clot. But we don't have any reason to suspect that was the case for Adriana, but it's on the differential. Also systemic infections. So for example, COVID-19, we know results in a lot of increased clots. Maybe Adriana had some kind of viral infection going on during the pregnancy that increased her risk of clotting. But if she had even an ear infection, that could have contributed to the blood clotting that went into her cerebral venous system, otitis media, meningitis in the meninges of the brain, the sinuses, the mastoids, something like that could have also contributed. And then there's, as I mentioned, estrogen containing fertility treatments or hormone therapy. That could have been something that she was on as well. We don't really know, but these are all things that any woman who's pregnant needs to think about to decrease their risk of getting blood clots and also these tragic stroke-like syndromes. The other thing is iron deficiency anemia is a common issue for women who are pregnant. And so it's something that can also increase your risk. I mentioned autoimmune diseases, but there's a whole bunch of autoimmune diseases. So if you have a risk of autoimmune disease, you want to get that worked up and mitigated as much as possible. Hyperthyroid and overactive thyroid could have contributed to blood clotting as well. This is very common, often screened for in pregnancy, but maybe this was missed by the doctors when she first found out she was pregnant. Maybe there was delayed presentation to the OB-GYN. Who knows? Dehydration can also increase risk for blood clots. 
especially if there's vomiting. There's a syndrome called hyperemesis gravidum, very, very commonly in the first trimester, women are vomiting a lot. And this is a, a mechanism that's been designed to decrease exposure to the baby of dangerous food substances and toxins in food. So essentially nature has designed this mechanism. So women start vomiting a lot in the first trimester, and that keeps the baby safe from a lot of toxins that we normally eat in our food. During those critical windows, when the limbs are forming and the body is forming and the basic body plan is forming for the baby. But this vomiting syndrome could have contributed to blood clotting through dehydration, through electrolyte imbalances and other things. So that's something to consider as well. We don't know exactly what was going on with her, but also immobility. You may have heard the advice that when you go on an airplane, you got to get up and walk every one or two hours because it's more common than it should be that people go on a long flight across the country, maybe from New York to San Francisco, and then they get off the plane and they have a difficulty breathing because there's a blood clot that developed in their legs and it went to their lungs. And sometimes they can even die of that. That's called a pulmonary embolus. But for anyone who is at risk for blood clots, they need to not be immobile. They need to be getting around and not staying in bed for a long time. In a lot of cultures, there's this belief that when you're in your first trimester pregnancy, the woman should just sit still and not do anything, stay in bed all day because the baby has to settle. That's really bad medical advice, actually. It's more of like a cultural superstition because immobility increases the risk of blood clots. So that's the opposite of what you want to do. You want to be walking normally. You don't want to do intensive exercise, but you want to have a normal daily routine where you're doing healthy types of movement to prevent blood clots. So it could have been a risk here. We don't know. And then there's also possible genetic factors. When somebody presents with this kind of a severe clotting syndrome in their first pregnancy, normally a doctor will think of running some tests to test for genetic factors. There's a bunch of obscure, rare things, but you want to think of them. Factor five Leiden mutations in certain genes, protein C or S deficiency, antithrombin three deficiency. These are things to think about, but that's probably the most common explanation that's going to come to mind. I think that's the most likely explanation, but there's also this other type of explanation, number two, called an ischemic arterial stroke. So like a large vessel occlusion or an embolic stroke, basically a blood clot in the arterial supply, not the veins, but the arteries. So the arteries are the vessels that bring blood from the heart to the body and the veins bring blood back to the heart from the body. So you can have a blood clot also in the arteries. So why would that have happened? Maybe she had a part of her heart that had a little hole in it and that there was a blood clot that developed called an embolism that went to her brain because it's very common for blood clots to go from the legs to the lungs, but to get to the brain, it has to typically start in the heart. So perhaps she had one of these things called a patent for an ovale that was never detected and it caused this blood clot to go to her brain. It's very common to have atrial fibrillation. A lot of people are walking around with atrial fibrillation and it's really easy to detect. You can detect this using your smartphone, using a Apple watch, but it's a very large percentage of people are walking around, don't realize they have atrial fibrillation. And again, to get to the brain with a blood clot, you need to probably start in the heart. So maybe she had this and it was undetected and some clots went up to her brain from her heart. Although it's rare for a 31 year old woman, unless there's some underlying issue. But the risk of atrial fibrillation does go up as we gain weight. That's something to think about as well. Arterial dissection, maybe she had a sudden dissection means essentially the blood vessel started rupturing, but she could have had a dissection in her carotid artery, her vertebral artery, which is going from the neck to the brain. Those dissections or opening up could have resulted in a blood clot forming and then going into her brain in a large way. Vasculitis, again, if she had lupus or an autoimmune disease, it can also cause effects in the brain and that can cause inflammation of the blood vessels in the brain. So that's all the reasons why there might have been an ischemic stroke. That's number two as like the cause, most likely cause. And number three, there could have been just this bleeding in the brain, a hemorrhage in the brain intracranially. This could be after a clot or maybe she had high blood pressure that was not detected. High blood pressure is incredibly common in America and all over the world. And most people who have high blood pressure probably don't think about it because it doesn't affect you until you have these tragic outcomes. So I would say everyone should have a home blood pressure monitor. I have mine here, actually. It's very easy to buy this for 15, 20 bucks online or at your local pharmacy. But 
a very large percentage of people don't know they have high blood pressure and a cause of intracranial hemorrhage, the most common cause is probably high blood pressure. So perhaps Adriana had high blood pressure and it was never really followed or checked. Unfortunately, the African-American population has a much higher risk of high blood pressure. So this is possibly something that would come to my mind if I was trying to investigate this case. I would look for that. And there, there could also be a hemorrhage due to some kind of infarction in the venous system or some kind of clotting that happened in the veins. It can be secondary to that clot. So it could be like a cascading set of symptoms. It could have started with a, a clot in the veins and it could have become a hemorrhage afterwards. In addition, she may have, no, this is more rare. That's why this is the third thing on my hypothesis, but it could have been more rare, but she might have had an underlying aneurysm in the brain or a malformation. There's things called AVM, arteriovenous malformations. Maybe there was just something there that ruptured all of a sudden with high blood pressure or with the hormonal changes of pregnancy. Sometimes you see these tragic presentations in pregnancy where a woman with seemingly no other issues just shows up with these dramatic neurological changes. And sometimes these are the underlying causes. She probably never had a brain scan, never had an MRI, never had a CT scan. Preeclampsia and eclampsia is a big issue in the African-American population for women. It's rare that it's going to happen this early, but it's not impossible. So maybe this was an early emerging eclampsia or preeclampsia syndrome. This includes high blood pressure, difficult damage to the liver, a cascade of other inflammatory things, but also it can present with this kind of stroke. There's also now getting to more rare stuff, TTP and HELP syndrome. This is really very rare. I would say this is very unlikely, but I put it here just because it's on the differential. It's very unusual at nine weeks, but if she had labs done at the hospital, which she should have done, uh, I think they just gave her pain medicine and sent her home, which is not good, but they should have run complete labs to look for changes in her um, thrombocytopenia, high liver enzymes, LFTs, and so on. But again, in the end, what can we learn from this? I think what really matters here is that we have to not delay the workup for a pregnant woman who's presenting with neurological symptoms, even at nine weeks, we got to take it really seriously. Go to the hospital right away. Don't stay home. Don't just tell yourself you're going to take some Tylenol and everything's going to be okay. It's better to be safe than sorry. It's better to just say, oh, I don't want to burden those doctors. Just annoy them a little bit. It's okay. Don't worry about it. There's this huge delay in recognition. And number two, when you get to the hospital, don't leave until you figure out exactly what's causing the problem. Demand a workup, demand imaging, demand labs. Because remember, the hospital's job is to save money. And all they're going to do is check off a box and say, the person's not dead. They're stable. They can go home. But you're not really worried about the hospital's finances. You're worried about your life and the life of your baby and your wife, your sister, your daughter, you. So make sure that you demand an appropriate workup. Yes, you're going to have some radiation exposure by getting a CT scan of the head, an MRI, but there's worse things than that, like dying. So I know a lot of people hate going to the doctor, hate going to the hospital, but it's definitely w worth it to get it checked up. And then, like I said, don't go home until symptoms resolve. The hospital has a responsibility to take care of you. Emergency rooms have a legal obligation to always see people who come to them, but there's only a partial overlap between their interest and your interest, and that dissociates when they can check off a box and say, person's stable enough to go home. Somebody else's doctor, go see your ob -GYN. So it's important to make sure that you have a really good solution in play. So this tragic case, I really hope I've been able to shed some light on it. And I really hope the family will find some solace and we can prevent these things from happening to other families and women and babies as well. So take care and reach out for help. Thanks.